and this is my pleasure today to give a short introduction about our DLTS API. So let me start with sharing my uh, screen first. So let's go to the uh, presentation. So I think just now uh, George has already given a very nice uh, introduction of the Python API and also he's also developing Python API for use in DLTS. Uh, that's a great achievement. I must say congrats for that. And in this part, I'll be just trying to offer you a way uh, to learn how to program on your own and also, you know, trying to customize it if you have some special needs. So let's first answer a quick question. Why are we, you know, doing this? Why are we using the API for the DLTS? So with Teams great demonstration, I think many of you uh, already seen, we have a very nice uh, graphical user interface in Lab One, and with Lab One we can do many different applications, including you know sweep, voltage, uh, you know including the offsides and the frequency, and but you know there are cases where you want to simply automate your entire measurement, or you want to sweep different parameters, uh, or particularly use the MFA together with a third-party instrument. And actually, all these three conditions are met in terms of uh, DLTS. Remember, the temperature ramp can take quite long, and that temperature is controlled by a third-party temperature controller. And therefore, I would say API is really helpful in this application. So obviously, to use it, you need to download the Lab1 software and also the API module. And I don't want to spend too much time reading them into detail, uh, but I'd like to just make a short statement here. Usually when we give an introduction of the API, we will begin with a full introduction, trying to highlight the architecture of the API and also including some node trees and some data structures. Uh, I won't go through them here, and rather I would just provide, a, let's say some tips or shortcuts to tell you how to program on your own in a relatively simple fashion. So how does it work? Well, this is the tip. Uh, I would call it minimalism, or you can also say it's uh, less is more. Uh, we can start with the Lab1 graphical user interface as our reference. And this is because the Lab1 GUI has already many built-in plotting functions so that you don't have to write those in your own codes. I think just now what George shows is just exactly what it means. So you can visualize almost everything in the GUI already, and you don't have to write on your own. And then we can try to make the best use of the API command log, and I can show you that later in the live demo. This will make our life much easier. Uh, so you don't have to learn you know, which syntax you should use. And then after that, we can just optimize the parameters one by one, and then finally integrate with your other setup. So with that, let's just quickly move to a quick demonstration. Let me move to my lab by user interface. Uh, so this is how it looks like when you freshly open the MFIA. And if you click this button to have a look at the API command log, you will see it looks like this. Uh, we have the default settings, including the sweeper uh, and also the impedance. Uh, this is for the user compensation part. We don't really need them. So let's only copy and paste this part into your Python program, which might look like this. I have already pasted the uh, codes here just to save some time and also to avoid myself being too nervous and made some typos in a live demo. Uh, please excuse me here. But other than that, you see I have just included the NumPy module and my probably for some convenient processing and plotting. I have also changed the device model number to my device. So once you have done that, if you click run, the instrument will just you know, be connected also by the API. This is just how it works. There is no feedback message because I didn't call the printing function for that feedback message, but trust me it's connected. And also that means the API can run in parallel with the GUI. Uh, if you want to know why, <laughs> please just spend some time watch the full introduction video. So let's just go back to the graphical interface. Right now I'm using exactly the site, same setup as Team was using, 
And just to quickly recap what the TP is set for the LTS. So for the LTS, actually we need, let's say a square pulse. Maybe I set it maybe let's say six milliseconds high state, one milliseconds uh, low state, and I set this to be on. And using the auxiliary output, I will amplify this uh, square pulse from a logical digital pulse into a analog pulse with a scaling factor of minus two volts. Uh, once we have done that, we open the login tab, uh, click this add button just to add the uh, square pulse together to the sine wave output. And finally, we move to the impedance analog ladder tab, change the frequency to one megahertz, and maybe increase the bandwidth to maybe, let's say, from 110k. Once we have done that, we will see in the plotter, you know, the result comes straight away. Let me remove the rest three for clarity. So this is actually the transient capacitance, what you want to look like. And you see actually it looks pretty well. And now if we just refresh the command log, we will see after these uh, sweeper settings, what comes is just what we have just said. Uh, basically each line corresponds to each different command I have done just in the GUI. If we now come just simply copy and paste this part into the uh, Jupyter notebook, we will have this same code. And just because they are exactly the same as we have done in the GUI, if I let it run here, we'll, it will basically do no change because they are exactly the same. And just to verify the, you know, the API can run, let's just increase the bandwidth from 10K to 100K. And if we write right now, and then let's go back to the GUI, we will see the measurement, you know, from here, the bandwidth is indeed increased from 10K to 100K. The square, let's say the capacitance changes here almost, they look almost the same. Uh, just a bit noisy because we increase the bandwidth by 10 times. And to confirm, we can also make it back and we just decrease to 10K, click enter again and wait for a few seconds. And we see, okay, now everything's back and the transient capacitance becomes smoother again. So at this point, if you're happy working with a continuous data stream, uh, we can already call it problem solved uh, because the rest of this is a pure Python data program you know, processing question, not dependent on the Python API anymore. But I think just now both George and previously uh, Jim has made, sorry, team has mentioned, uh, you know, it's very preferable to work uh, in a triggered fashion. And that can be done uh, with our data acquisition module. But before doing that, let's stop from here. And I think uh, there's also a question that George didn't really cover just now is, you know, when you are running the plotter together with some other modules, they are sort of competing for the bandwidth. And therefore, if you are not using the plotter, it's better to just stop it for the moment being. So let's now move to the DAQ module and quickly set up. Uh, so in the DAQ module, uh, let's just say we, we are only interested in the capacitance right now. So let's just add IA parameter two as the parameter of interest. Uh, we take a shortcut here. We will use the capacitance itself as the trigger rather than a hardware trigger, you know, an analog voltage. This is actually a unique uh, advantage of the MFI, you know, the software triggering. You know, it basically removes almost all the dependence from your hardware triggering. If there's any kind of delay or latency there, uh, you don't have to worry about it. So assuming we don't know the trigger level, just click the fund. It will automatically search for the trigger level it by itself. And if you want to increase the capture duration or number of repetitions or averaging, feel free to give a different number. But just with this, it's already enough. We click single and we will see the transient capacitance come straight away within tens of milliseconds. That's it. And this is, that is just how that it can be done in the GUI. Now, if we refresh the command log, we will see after the uh, second part, we have the data acquisition module codes also popping up. Okay, here's something that I must emphasize. To run the data acquisition codes, uh, you can't just copy and paste. You must uncomment uh, the green lines here. 
The green lines code here are used to read out the data in real time during one capture. But I guess for DLTS, possibly you are more interested in looking at the entire capture afterwards, maybe even after 20 sweeps, you know, 20 captures after the entire temperature ramp. And therefore, in the code, uh, we basically replace that uh, commented session with this part. Uh, if you don't know where to find it, you can also look for some other uh, official examples included in our Python package and just copy and paste from there. So how it works, there is a timeout period which allows you to sort of define the buffer. If something wrong happens during the capture, it will basically quit from the capture sequence. And the central part is uh, this progress indicator. So once the progress reaches one or 100%, it will automatically jump out from the while loop by itself. So if I click run right now, uh, you will see the progress indeed goes from zero to almost 100% within a second. Of course, that's because the entire capture sequence just take about tens of milliseconds. So now if we take a look how the data look like, well, this part is a bit interesting. The data is in the format of a nasty dictionary. And I guess if you are a more or less experienced Python programmer, you already know how to take the data out. But if you are familiar, or let's say not so familiar with it, then let me just briefly illustrate what is going on. So the first level P of this dictionary here is the node we just subscribe to, and that is the capacitance. Second level P can be the timestamp or the value. Well, value is easy. It's a two dimensional array and the number here has the unit of forward and you can just use it directly as the capacitance of interest. The timestamp here uh, possibly need a bit of attention. The unit here is number of instrument clock cycles or inverse something rate. So basically to convert into real time, uh, you need to divide the interval here to the clock rate of the instrument. And to do that, we can just, you know, call the samples by extracting the first level key. And then in the plotting function, the y part is just sample zero value zero, the capacitance. The x part is uh, sort of a renormalized uh, time. We just subtract the timestamp, the last one to the first one, and divide it to the cloud base and run it over the entire length. So with this code, if we click run, we will just see the transit capacitance captured by the lab one, sorry, the lab one Python API. And if we compare this plot with the, you know, lab one GUI captured results, they look pretty much the same. So that basically confirms how you can quickly set up a lab one API, you know, in Python program on your own. And of course, a final step would be integrated together with your temperature controller. Well, okay, I don't have a temperature controller here at my hand, but just assuming you can write some pseudo codes, you know, with a single variable T to define the temperature and a simple for loop with start point, end point, number of steps, set temperature and measurement. This will just complete everything in this, uh, you know, entire capture sequence. So let's now move back to the uh, uh, slides. Just now I mentioned two parts of the DLTS. Uh, particularly the data acquisition module. If you want even a shorter cut to that, uh, there is something which can help you. That's our uh, ZHDN's toolkit, the higher, let's say, Python uh, extension to the standard ZA Python kit. So how it works? So in the toolkit, we have a built-in function called uh, daq.measure. If you use that, you don't have to write the same while loop anymore. So this single line is equivalent to maybe seven or eight lines uh, in that code. But you know, in terms of how it works, actually they work pretty much the same. There's almost no difference. About stripping the data for uh, the timestamp, uh, if you are using the toolkit, you can just call data.time and you don't have to convert it on your own. And this will also simplify some of your workflow. Okay, so uh, I don't have too much time here. If you are interested in learning the toolkit, you can also have a look at the reference here below. Uh, so that's all from my side. Uh, 
we will have a question and answer session after the votos part. Uh, that's the second part of the uh, tutorial. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to post it into the question and answer tab in the Zoom chat window. So that not, right now, please just let me hand it to Roboto. Uh, the floor is yours then. Thanks. Thanks, Manga, for your nice introduction to the APIs. Uh, uh, let me share the screen. OK, so um, Manga introduced you the APIs that we, uh, that we we give uh, for free for download for the customer. I will focus in the second part uh, to a specific API library that is the one for LabVIEW. LabVIEW is a graphical programming language that you probably know is uh, produced and sold by National Instruments. It is a very nice environment to, for controlling uh, uh, external instrument to the, to the PC. Uh, okay, let's first, Sorry. Let's first uh, um, a brief uh, uh, introduction to how to install the LabVIEW APIs because there is a specific procedure in this case because when you download and install the Lab one package, you have uh, the LabVIEW API directory in your PC, but you must remember to manually copy and paste this directory to a specific LabVIEW subfolder uh, that is called inst.lib. Uh, it is a standard procedure uh, for a LabVIEW user, so it would be not difficult to do it. When you do it uh, and you open LabVIEW, you will find uh, the APIs, uh, so the function palette for controlling our instrument. In this uh, subfolder of the function palette in LabVIEW called instrument.io. So the Zurich instrument lab one palette uh, as you can see on this picture, is made of three VIs and several other VIs uh, uh, in four uh, categories, configure, data, utility, and uh, modules. How to use this VI? What I suggest to you to, to do first is to open a VI called the VI3. VI3 is a standard VI uh, that is not uh, functional, so you cannot run it but it contains in the diagram all the VIs uh, of the, um, that uh, are included in the API um, divided and categorized by the, uh, their, uh, their folder. And uh, you can see also an example of how to use it. For example, uh, initialize, configuration, uh, close, and so on. So, of course, you can start your lab your programming using this single uh, VIs uh, and uh, our uh, manual, but several times it is uh, uh, quite easier to start from an example. We give uh, about 30 examples uh, based on LabVIEW uh, that you can find in our uh, uh, project, the, the project that is a, a, a container that uh, we give with the, the, in, in the folder. Uh, the project contains uh, all these examples, but probably it will be easier for you to use uh, a specific functionality in LabVIEW called the find example, because in this way you can also filter for keywords. For example, you can filter for the impedance and you will find immediately the example for using MFIA in LabVIEW. There is one example dedicated. And what about the LTS application? We don't have any example currently in the APIs, but I will show you a new software that we developed for LabVIEW users, specifically for building the LTS uh, system uh, that is called LabVIEW DLTS acquisition. What you need uh, to use this, so this new software, you need a license full of professional of LabVIEW version 2009 on uh, more recent. Of course, uh, the LabVIEW API, LabVIEW one API is uh, the latest version that you can download from our website. An MFIA and IBNC cable 
for doing the same connection that you uh, saw in the previous presentation by Meng and the team. So to connect auxiliary output to one to auxiliary input to one. A fixture to connect uh, the device under test, uh, so the, the material that we want to test uh, to the MFIA. <clears throat> I will use uh, for this demo a simple uh, red LED connected to our fixture MFITF, but typically in this uh, application, you will use uh, something custom. And you need a third party temperature controller for controlling the cryogenic temperature. Uh, what is not covered by this application? Uh, as you know for sure, uh, Zurich Instrument doesn't produce any temperature controller. So it is not uh, a type of uh, instrument that we have in the catalog. So I will use a simulated software. Uh, because we want, don't want to indicate a specific temperature control. You can uh, decide to, to buy and use uh, the, the, the best that you find in the, in the market uh, or some, something that you have in your lab, in your laboratory. Uh, so what you need to do uh, in order to complete this application, you need to create and develop the custom code in LabVIEW for uh, your temperature controller that is physically presented uh, pre present in your uh, in your lab. How to do it? Uh, typically, you can start from an instrument driver similar to our uh, API that you can download by the uh, National Instrument website. Or uh, if it, it is not present, you can use the, the protocol defined by the producer. Okay. So this is the front panel of the new, this new software. On the left, uh, you can see several parameters. Of course, uh, the serial number of uh, MFIA. Uh, then you have uh, a pa uh, some uh, parameters for the bias pulse train generation. Uh, some parameters uh, regarding the data acquisition, for example, number of sample, uh, how, how many uh, waveforms we want to average in order to, to have a better uh, uh, measurement at the end. And uh, uh, three parameters, three values for the temperature controller that uh, this software will pass to the temperature controller uh, virtual instrument. Finally, we have uh, the indication of the where, where to save the data in, uh, in a typical LabVIEW for file format that is compatible with Excel. On the right, uh, we will, you will see the measurement uh, graph and uh, the table of the measurement. And of course, a temperature that we are <clears throat> at the moment. So let's go to the, let's switch to the demo, to the LabVIEW. Okay, so now we are in LabVIEW uh, 2021. If I run the application, so um, consider I'm connected with the MFIA, you know, as in the, in the picture uh, uh, that you see before. I can uh, change, uh, now we have the time to change the parameters. For example, we have another uh, uh, switch that can be useful if you decide to use an external generator instead of using uh, the internal generation uh, of uh, the MFIA. Why should I prefer an external function generator? Typically for having a smaller uh, rising time and falling time of our, uh, of the paths that we want to apply to, to the material. Okay, because typically a function generator can be better in defining the paths. Uh, we can also decide to have a manual uh, acquisition. What does it mean? It means that uh, when the temperature, the new temperature will be stable, we can decide to, to put, uh, to, to have a switch, a manual switch uh, in order to start manually the new measurement uh, of the, the capacitance. Uh, we will use uh, the automatic uh, data acquisition. That means uh, when the temperature controller has finished to, to, to set the new value temperature, uh, this program will automatically take the new measurement. Okay, so 
no input of, by, the, by the user. Okay, let's start uh, the, the measurement, the, the program. Okay, so you can see in the graph uh, two traces, the red trace, the, the blue trace is the auxiliary input, uh, so the, the pulse that we are generating. The red <coughs> trace uh, is the capacitor measurement. Here you have uh, this value in the table. You see the temperature is uh, decreasing for uh, one degree. When I want, when I <clears throat> want to see what's happening in the temperature controller VI, that is a, an <clears throat> another LabVIEW uh, VI running in parallel, we can click this button. Okay, we are almost finishing. So lat latest value. Okay, when I press down, the program has finished. We can have a look at the, at the block diagram. Of course, uh, if you are a lab user, you can see something meaningful. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> I, I understand that is not uh, easy. But uh, these functions that you see are the function included in the APIs. Okay, in a typical uh, double wire connection. These uh, yellow uh, icon function are sub VI that I created for this, uh, for this application. Inside you can find the parameters that uh, Meng uh, showed you in Python. They are quite the same. Of course, here they are string that are sent by LabVIEW to the Lab1 data server. Okay, let's uh, have a look on the data file. So the, the, the file log, the, the log file that we created. If I double click this uh, TDMS file, maybe can have a strange uh, uh, name, but uh, it is really a nice uh, file format because automatically Excel open it, you have a, a sheet here with an either, but then you have a complete table. Uh, of course, you have the first column that is the x axis, the time axis, and then uh, each temperature you have uh, the bias pulse and the DLTS uh, measurement. Okay, you can save it uh, then in Excel in several formats. Good, so. Uh, let's uh, go back to the presentation. Okay. So what is the idea behind this uh, new software? The idea is to create uh, a double uh, uh, VI uh, application. So two VIs running in parallel. The main VI is complete and you can use it for acquiring data from MFIA, for the impedance analyzer, our instrument. The other VI is the temperature control VI that now is a dummy VI, so a simulated program. If you fill this second VI with the real temperature controller code using these seven global variables uh, defined in the, in the project, the, the system will work very well. Okay, so uh, you need only to use this specific uh, variable that are uh, some, some are uh, double, uh, so they are values, other are Boolean for uh, the end shaking between the two programs. So which are the limitation? Of course, uh, uh, this is a, a software that we created uh, it's not a turnkey solution, so don't think of it of something that you install and uh, use it immediately. So it's like a template. Uh, we have not tested it with a real DTS experimental setup yet, so uh, it is done in, uh, in my office uh, with uh, my MFIA. And uh, so in the future, we, we will try to test it uh, 
uh, with a real uh, system. Uh, it works only with MFIA, not with uh, CEPTUALI or uh, the previous version. Uh, of course, we, it is, they are completely different product, so we decided to use uh, and to adopt uh, the, the new one uh, and uh, the one that we suggest uh, car, uh, currently. It doesn't include any DLTS analysis. As you, as you uh, have seen in, the, in, the, in my demo, we end uh, our program and uh, acquiring the data and saving to disk. Uh, why? Because uh, we know that there are several algorithms that can be implemented, uh, complicated, uh, depending on the material. So you can, you, you can do and you can add uh, um, easily the processing code uh, even incorporating Python or MATLAB because the LabVIEW has a specific function for incorporating these two uh, languages. And um, this software is a source, source code. So uh, feel free to uh, open it and to change the parameters, uh, what you want, you can customize it. So we give it for free as an example, okay? Okay, if you are interested to use this code, please write to me. Uh, we decided not to put this in, as, a, as a download in the website because it's very specific for, for a specific application and is not, uh, yes, completely tested. But if you are interested to try it in your lab, write to me and uh, of course, any suggestion for future version uh, versions will be welcome.